So our next speaker is Ashwin, who will be giving us a talk of Kubernetes at eBay. So with that, I want to give a big round of applause. So hello all. Um, my name is Ashwin, and I uh, work at eBay, and I work for a group called eBay Cloud Services. So we basically own the whole cloud infrastructure and platform services. Uh, we also own all the data services, database infrastructure, and analytical infrastructure. So that pretty much covers like the large chunk of what uh, you know eBay.com uses. Uh, in um, terms of uh, actual numbers, so our portfolio handles over half a million plus uh, uh, compute cores. Uh, we have uh, you know a ton of compute servers. Uh, we handle almost 200 petabyte of uh, data infrastructure, and uh, our systems. Uh, you know, uh, our logging systems, for example, uh, handles about you know, 300 plus terabytes a day, and uh, our monitoring systems do you know 2 million metrics per second. So that's a lot of uh, you know uh, data and uh, computing power we actually deal with. So um, our group is responsible for providing the entire infrastructure and the platform services which makes this happen. So the stack looks somewhat like this. So we have uh, the data center, uh, and then we have uh, an IES layer, which we lay on top of that. So that is actually uh, 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 provided by a few uh, solutions. Like we have a homegrown cloud, and we have OpenStack. So with a, uh, you know, with a combination of both, I think we uh, support our IES layer. And then we have a lot of like these platform services. Uh, they include uh, you know, all of those, uh, uh, the, 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 the ones I, which I was talking earlier, uh, the messaging services, monitoring, logging, security, all these applications. And we have different applications of uh, you know, different shapes and colors, which runs on this infrastructure. Now, because we have uh, these uh, IAS APIs, and we, expect, we have a lot of different types of these applications, they have different characteristics, and they are written to deal with the specificity of these applications. But some common aspects are there. If you look at uh, our application lifecycle, it's roughly like this. So we have all these application platforms provision those provision boxes, which they need. They deploy software onto that, and they monitor. Uh, there will be, uh, you know, of course, uh, 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 solutions which are helping them in that. And then they have uh, the remediation angle. So this is the, the default uh, cycle which most application platforms uh, at eBay goes through. Now. Um, Provisioning is a very straightforward aspect. You pick an image of your choice from your image repository and use one of the IES uh, tools and get it deployed, um, get it uh, provisioned. Uh, the second part of it, the deploy, we have uh, kind of standardized on that. We actually, for every uh, VM which we give out, or if any compute which you give out, whether it's a uh, virtual machine or a bare metal, we actually, uh, as part of the image, we mandate having an eBay host agent on that. So. And then we have a, an app, a state server uh, where we, which stores the application state, the expected application state. And then we have an application binary repository which stores all the application binaries. So these application binaries are uh, packages, uh, application, you know, a tar file. And our deployment tools actually uh, invoke the, the, the app A here is any app platforms. So they actually invoke uh, over a TLS connection uh, what it has to bring down on the machine. So this, this works uh, perfectly to handle all the different type of applications. And this is actually like how majority of our applications are running now. And we are actually moving more and more applications to this uh, particular uh, scheme of things. Um, there are, however, a couple of problems with this thing. As you can imagine, so what we do is like we bring down a tar right from our app binary, uh, you know, repository. And then we uh, actually explode the var into a file system tree. So we have app one and app two all running on the same operating system. So if there are binary dependencies which one application needs, which another one you know is conflicting with, you have problems because every single every single thing happens on a single machine. So to avoid that, we actually like mandate running a single VM per application. So VM per, one one VM per application. That's uh, uh, the model in, in a single host. So this clearly is not the way we want to go because you know this actually introduces other problems. We cannot introduce framework services. For example, our logging system is a separate, you know, managed by a separate group. And if they want to introduce uh, the, uh, the the log shipping or any of those aspects uh, or monitoring, for example, into this uh, host, it requires uh, coordination with two different uh, groups, and it's hard because we have a single machine where everything happens. So we would love for that model to move to something like this 
where we would want to change our, uh, the standard host agent to be managed by kubelet uh, on a Docker container. And in that model, all, the, all our applications would be pods, and then we would change our states over to uh, you know, be the Kubernetes API server and our you know, app registry to be, I mean, so the binary repository to be a container. So this will help us uh, you know, in definitely like, uh, introducing more app framework level services into any applications, and we are not uh, application stack uh, dependent. Right now, most of our uh, stack is dependent on Java, and all the uh, tools which you write are also Java. So um, when we want to introduce uh, newer tools, this is like you know, a way uh, uh, we can uh, deal with that. So another problem of, uh, I think Brian mentioned earlier in his, speak, uh, in his speech about uh, the static uh, provisioning um, aspects. So because we are scheduling using um, IAS level primitives, this is what we end up like after uh, applications have taken up their fair share of resources, not fair, the share of resources. So you can see like you know, some uh, uh, pass applications could take up a lot of uh, you know, computing power there and you know, hold it. Uh, though there may be this like, you know, lone application A, uh, which probably is like a machine learning application which wants to run this uh, job for like, let's say like a few hours, but he does not have any um, computing resources available because it's already taken by different application groups. And this is a huge problem in a, a, a private cloud where the resources are finite. You cannot just burst out. You know, there is not any more resources to get. So we have to maximally utilize the resources we have. We have a large fleet, but, but this is a huge problem. Uh, people who need it does not get the resources in the, in the time and uh, um, I mean, in the time frame they want. So we would love uh, it to uh, be replaced by this model where the entire fleet is managed by a central cluster manager and the application frameworks, the, the X passes and you know, the data services, big data, all sharing this common um, set of machines all mediated through a cluster manager. Um, these are you know, uh, mostly like the application-centric uh, issues. Then when we get into the infrastructure uh, level of issues, we have all these machines and we have this, uh, we, we spend a lot of money on you know, buying these expensive uh, uh, middle boxes, the firewalls and the load balancers. We also spend a lot of money on you know, building world-class networks, so we have a fabric design which allows two machines to speak uh, to each other online rate, right? So the machines are really, you know, the, the network is capable. We can actually, if you wanted, like send traffic from this to this uh, at the full land rate. But because, like, you know, we have these middle boxes in, in between, we actually are introducing a, a, a big uh, a choke point, and, and we want to get rid of that. We would ideally want to, like, move to this model where each of those nodes have a part of that function realized within them, and then, you know, they communicate directly to each other. Uh, Cube allows us to um, provide for this model where we can distribute our firewall and you know, um, load balancing functions across all the nodes. So those are uh, some of the reasons, the main reasons why you know, we chose uh, Kubernetes. Um, and, and if you want to really drill down, like, you know, the number one aspect is like, you know, eBay is a pro open source uh, you know, company. We pretty much take only open source tools and we make it better and then, you know, adapt it for our own internal use cases. Uh, so that's number one reason why Kubernetes is a good uh, uh, you know, solution uh, for us. And then uh, the container-based runtime. So Kube is opinionated, like it wants to deal only with containers. And I think that's a good uh, opinion, in, in, my, uh, in my opinion, because we don't want like, the host to have too many uh, aspects. It has to be well contained. And uh, basing the entire runtime on containers helps us do that. The third is like you know a pretty important aspect too, the declarative application centric abstraction. Uh, when we are dealing with uh, distributed uh, systems, we need to, need, need to have those primitives which are understandable by the developers of those things without necessarily having to understand the underlying um, uh, infrastructure details. So the cube primitives are pretty awesome. Like you know we have replication controllers, parts, services. They just get their job done without you know uh, imposing any uh, issues. Then. Um, the architecture allows for like a, a central state store which can be watchable and then you can have a numerous number of control loops which are based on that. We have leveraged that in various places to custom configure our load balancers so that you know, we don't uh, uh, cover all the parts uh, you know, in each of those uh, uh, load balancers. We can selectively choose machines of our choice. And uh, the cloud provider and infrastructure plugin model is very well defined. So, I mean, we were uh, in, in the last six months, uh, we were able to do a, quite a lot of uh, changes to suit our uh, needs. And there's a lot of uh, support from OpenStack. 
So we are basically an OpenStack uh, uh, shop. Uh, we have a lot of uh, in investment in there. And OpenStack has a project uh, called Magnum, which deals with uh, Kubernetes. So it, it, there's a good alignment there. And the, the community is awesome and great thought leadership uh, from people like Brian, Tim, and others. Like, you know, just unbelievable. So the crux of the thing is like, you know, from the current model where we have like, the application platforms and framework services having to deal with this, we want to simplify that to a simple run model where we declare our intent and Kubernetes takes care of the whole thing um, for us. Well, um, so I think the, the next part is like the challenges so far. Um, so one of the first uh, uh, and the biggest challenges for us, I think like for a lot of people out there, are, uh, is tied to the networking aspect of it. So IP routability. So Kubernetes expects every host to have a, a Cedar block routed to that. Um, so it, it actually is uh, slightly hard depending on which cloud provider you are, uh, especially if you are an open stack. OpenStack does not uh, have the right primitives. For, uh, for example, in Google Compute Cloud, you have this object called a route. Even Amazon, you have an object called route, which allows you to route a serial block to a particular host. In OpenStack, you simply do not have that. So we have to deal with something like that. Also, like, you know, we have, depending on the regions which we are, and, uh, and depending on the zones we operate, we, we have different networking models. So across, even, uh, across those zones, even though they are all open stack, we have different networking designs. And the IP routability has to work in, in, in all those things. And density is another issue. Uh, IPv4 space is, uh, internal IPv4 space is pretty limited, uh, and containers are imposing some tough constraints on that. So that's another thing we have to deal with. And multi-tenancy, though we are uh, a single company, we have different units, and they, we all have to like, you know, uh, operate in the same cloud. So this is another aspect which we are pretty careful about. Um, so I'll just run out, uh, you know, uh, explain like, how we are doing uh, open stack based overlay uh, solution uh, for our uh, network routing. So we did not want to use like, on-container networking solutions. We wanted to leverage what we already had uh, with open stack. So in this model, what we do is like we use Neutron to create uh, a cube router, which is a private cube-specific network, if you would. And then we would create a one network, a Neutron network object per host which you provision. So if you have two different nodes, then we would have two different networks. And each of those networks are in, in, in OpenStack, each network is a layer two construct. But uh, it actually works out pretty well for us because each node is uh, in, uh, the, the, the the span of the network is constrained to a node. Uh, we have a fairly advanced uh, SDN solution, um, so which allows us to use distributed uh, routing between two of these nodes. So that works well for um, uh, if you are in an overlay-based uh, zone, I think this works. But I think we have some um, upper bounds to this thing. I think we can go up to a, like a, a 500 uh, uh, server nodes in this model. But what we really want to get uh, is to uh, support this on uh, real production uh, loads, and there we want to use something more stable, like you know, like a, a layer three routed model. So we have uh, developed like you know uh, certain scripts which allows us to like you know configure these tors uh, for allowing us to route the traffic uh, specifically, uh, which are meant for the uh, the the Cedar block, but uh, for a VM. Um, there are multiple ways we can do that. Currently, we are actually statically provisioning these stores um, through our uh, internal APIs, network APIs. But uh, I think the plan is to move to something more dynamic like uh, BGP. I cover that in, you know, in detail in the next session. So these are like now where we want to go. We want to actually even try to do BGP all the way to the host. So it's not just you know into the tor. We want to like take it all the way to host. So each host acts as like a uh, you know a router. Um, and then uh, the layer seven load balancing. This is a service routing which we are uh, deeply interested in. Uh, uh, we are wanting to start on that very quickly here. And for the IP density issue, uh, we are looking at IPv6 or possibly an overlapping uh, overlay based solution. So this is uh, still in uh, discussion phase. Uh, we haven't made a call on that yet. Um, so that's uh, uh, networking and then security. So. Um, uh, security is another aspect. There are multiple uh, bits to it. Uh, one is like actual access to the Kubernetes itself. Um, since we have uh, investment in OpenStack, so we leverage the uh, Keystone project 
uh, as our IAM provider to access the Kubernetes APIs. So basically in this model, you'd go to the Keystone, get a token, and use the token to access your uh, Kube APIs. So I here uh, wrote the plugin and we substreamed it. Um, and then the second part of that is like, you know, our con uh, the, the container security. So we are uh, wanting to invest heavily on these uh, bits, SE Linux, Comp, and you know, Docker Content Trust as ways to ensure our Docker ecosystem is uh, uh, safe. We also want to uh, invest uh, uh, in, into the distributed firewalls. There are some um, initial designs which we have. Uh, we'll be working on them actively. And the, the public key infrastructure on Kubernetes, that's some, something which you're deeply passionate about. Um, and then uh, policy-based IAM. So we are actually working on up, uh, getting a policy-based IAM up uh, for the community. Uh, we are working with a few groups to um, have open source, uh, make it open source. On the storage side, we also uh, did, uh, again, uh, we use OpenStack Cinder, which is a block storage abstraction in OpenStack. So we wrote the plugin. Srikanth here wrote that. Um, it is upstream to Kubernetes again. Uh, so that is working well. So it, all, of, all of our parts can get a persistent storage, and that moves along with the pod, regardless of the node failures. Um, so it's pretty cool. Um, we also want to like uh, uh, this is another area which uh, we should uh, invest uh, the local storage leases. We have a lot of big data applications which uses a lot of local SSD storage, um, but Kubernetes does not yet understand the local storage as a first class entity. So we need local leases so we can uh, have affinity of workloads towards the data, and this I think will help uh, applications such as Cassandra and other NoSQLs to uh, uh, perform uh, in, in the right manner. And next challenge is scale. Uh, we have currently we uh, run uh, anywhere from 5 to 20k servers per availability zone, and we have a lot of lots of these availability zones. And um, we need to sh make sure that you know Kubernetes can manage a large chunk of these machines per availability zone. So there are different uh, solutions for that. Cluster federation may be one, uh, but there are lots of uh, improvements in the uh, Kubernetes 1.1, and I think uh, plan for 1.2. So we are really hopeful that there will be some aspects of it uh, which are coming out of it we can use. Uh, we are also setting up a big scale testing lab um, and, and hoping to work with the scale sig, looking at Kubernetes uh, pretty actively. And uh, the, the the last one is like an idea where we where we are thinking that you know if the scale is actually to the um, in, in running the API servers, uh, could we uh, opt for a model where we are just uh, using the kubelet one time alone, and then we use our existing uh, deployment tools to go straight uh, talk to that straight, and then you know not have any clustering. Um, uh, necessarily not it, uh, have clustering for the entire fleet. So a lot of static workloads can use the kubelet runtimes, the pod objects, uh, and, and stuff like that, but you know, not uh, necessarily uh, be under the cluster management. So a couple of thoughts there. So that is pretty much like you know, what I had, uh, roughly from my uh, uh, side. And my name is uh, Ashwin, and uh, the, the uh, uh, Espatanis and Uday and Thug, like these other guys who work in our team, and they've uh, submitted the patches. So, if you want to know details of like what we have done, you know, please uh, reach out to us. Also, if you think like what we're doing is cool, we are hiring. There are lots of interesting things. So.